This is the first of two lectures that I'm making on financial forecasting. The first lecture will go through kind of the background of why we forecast and the basic approach to forecasting that we'll use. The second lecture will actually take you through um, forecasting a financial statement for a company. To start with, we, we don't really talk about the actual forecasting, but r rather why we forecast. Um, the, the purpose of creating a financial forecast and a financial plan ultimately is to achieve the goal or the mission statement of the organization. Um, the, the company we're going to look at in terms of the mission and the values and why they exist is Douglas Dynamics. And I chose this company because of the time of year. There's still a lot of snow outside. What Douglas Dynamics does is they produce snow plows and snow, snow removal equipment. Um, their mission statement or their statement of overall purpose is to capitalize on our competitive strengths to maximize cash flow to pay dividends, reduce indebtedness, and invest in our business to create stockholder value. And there's really two approaches to mission statements these days. One's a stockholder approach, and we see that with Douglas Dynamics. They focus on creating stockholder value. And then the other one's stake, uh, stakeholder driven. I'd like to show you an example of both of these. So Anadarko is a petroleum or an oil company and their mission statement is to deliver a competitive and sustainable rate of return to shareholders so this is definitely a stockholder or a shareholder approach they focus on creating shareholder wealth and maximizing shareholder wealth Ford has changed their uh, mission statement in the last few years this is uh, one that was created in 2010 and the idea is one of one Ford um, they're consolidating um, all of their operations with one focus. Um, you can see one team here, people working together as a lean global enterprise for automotive leadership as measured by customer, employee, dealer, investor, supplier, union council, and community satisfaction. So this is an idea of their mission statement. They're not only looking to maximize shareholder wealth, but looking at all the stakeholders. Traditionally, this has been more of a European approach. And then finally, for Merck, um, we can see their mission statement here. Uh, again, this is a German company, and it traditionally German companies and European com companies have a stakeholder approach rather than a shareholder or stockholder approach with regard to their mission statement. They have a rather large mission, a uh, long mission statement. Um, but if you read through it, it says that they see themselves as a successful and responsible company. Um, they're definitely a, a stakeholder driven because they articulate their objectives and target their interests uh, to those of their customers, providers of capital, which would be their investors, employees, and society. And as you th read through the mission statement, they note that they want to create meaningful benefits for consumers, their market partners, and their community their customers and then down here it actually talks about their investors so uh, definitely a different approach than what we would kind of see as the traditional American approach to or United States approach to mission statements um, more and more companies as they become more global are focusing their mission statements more on stakeholders in general and identifying those stakeholders rather than just stockholders The corporate scope defines its, the company's lines of business and its geographic area of operations. So, for example, for Douglas Dynamics, um, what they do is design, manufacture, and sell snow and ice control equipment for light trucks. And that consists of snow plows, sand and salt spreaders, and related parts and accessories. They do that primarily um, in the United States. So we see that is the North American leader. Um, so that defines where they operate, the North America. And what they do, they create um, snow equipment and ice removal equipment. Now, it's important for managers to understand what the scope of the business is so they don't exceed that scope and go into areas that they shouldn't be operating in. The statement of corporate objectives um, helps managers focus on the primary objectives for the, for the company. Again, the goal of the corporate objectives is to to detail different approaches to achieving the mission statement 
of the company. So for Douglas Dynamics, some of these corporate objectives are to continue to produce innovative products, seek out strategic acquisitions, and reduce fixed costs relative to variable costs to reduce the effects of downturns due to unprotected unpredictable weather in the economy. Note, however, there's not really any quantitative measures associated with these corporate objectives. We get uh, to those with the um, operating plans for the company. The corporate strategies are broad approaches for achieving goals rather than the detailed plans. It's the vision of what the firm's top management expects. So for Douglas Dynamics, their corporate strategies include continuous product innovation. In other words, they want to build new products to Im improve their sales, um, optimize their distributor network, have aggressive asset management profit focus, and have flexible lean enterprise flat platform. And so the goal is innovation and lean manufacturing in order to create profits and value. Their operating plans provide a detailed implement, implementation guide to help the firm realize its strategic vision. Most plans uh, include different targets for sales and profits, so these would be the quantitative measures that the company would have in order to direct uh, managers. And oftentimes these quantitative values are what determines bonuses and compensation, excuse me, um, performance compensation pay for managers. What the plan has in it is are things such as who is responsible for each particular function, when specific tasks are to be accomplished, and then targets for sales and profits. The financial plan is the very fine grain approach to determining what assets are going to be available and what assets are needed to achieve the operating plans for the company. Uh, the purpose of the financial plan, and you might put a little star by this, the purpose of the financial plan and the purpose of financial forecasting is to make sure that resources in, are in place in order to achieve the goals and objectives of the company. So we don't f create financial plans for the sake of creating financial plans, but it's really to make sure resources are in place to meet the goals uh, of the company. So we have to keep those in mind as we make the financial plan. The financial planning process generally involves the following five steps. First, we forecast the financial statements, and for that we'll use the percentage of sales method. Um, this deviates from your book quite a bit. Um, I don't really care for this chapter in your textbook. It's chapter nine. You'll see some overlap between what, I, what I'm, I'm going to teach this part and what's in your book. However, a lot of your textbook uh, deals with a certain spreadsheet and certain techniques, very specific techniques that they employ. Um, what I'm showing you is a more of a general approach. So the first step is uh, to use the percentage of sales method to forecast the financial statements. The second step is to determine the amount of capital that will be needed to support the plan, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. The third step is to establish a performance-based management compensation system that rewards employees for creating shareholder wealth. We're not really going to get into that at this point. Um, when we go get into determining val the value of the company and what drives the value of the company. We'll talk more about compensation plans then. Then finally, um, the fourth step is to monitor operations after implementing the plan to spot deviations and then take corrective actions. I serve on the finance committee for my church and this is an issue that we've had. Um, we pass a budget every year. We have to go to the congregation and get their approval for the budget, but then things happen in the meantime. Um, what we've seen this year is that giving has fall, fallen about 10% off of what we had budgeted. So how do we approach that? Uh, one approach would be to go back to the congregation and say, look, we don't have the money to support the plan, the financial plan that you approved. So we need to make a new financial plan. Um, that's really what would be recommended for organizations, for companies um, that face a slowdown in sales. Or maybe sales were great and sales are increasing and you have more profits than you expected. You'd also want to go back and um, correct, if you will, that deviation and rebudget to make sure that you're using the money, the additional money, as wisely as you can. The percentage of sales method. Um, for that, we determine which accounts vary directly with sales as a percentage of sales, and I refer to those as operating accounts. Um, operating accounts are accounts that will increase or decrease um, with sales, and these are accounts that are also necessary for the operations of the company.
The second step in the percent of sales method is determine the additional funds needed. And you'll also see these referred to as external funds needed. So for the first thing we do is we see how many funds we'll be able to generate internally to fund our growth. And then anything that's ne needed outside of that, we'll look at uh, obtaining funds externally. Or maybe we'll have a surplus and we'll need to get rid of some uh, additional funds. The next step is to decide how to raise the additional funds necessary or how to eliminate excess funds. And then the two things I look for and that I'll be looking for in your forecast are one, to make sure the balance sheet balances. So this is the accounting equation. Assets are equal to liabilities plus owner's equity. So your right hand side of your balance sheet should equal your left hand side of the balance sheet. And then finally to make sure that the retained earnings flow properly from one year to the next. So what I'll be looking for is that the current retained earnings or the forecasted year's retained earning are equal to the prior year's retained earnings plus the net income for the year minus the dividends paid. The percentage of sales forecast method requires us to start with um, a sales forecast. So the two things we t typically look at for forecasting sales are a review of past sales. So what's the direction of the company? Are they growing their revenues or are their revenues shrinking? Um, and how does that affect the future of the company? The other things we consider are conditions in the national and global economies, firms and its competitors' new products, planned advertising programs, etc. A few years ago, um, although they're very large, w mature, well-run companies, both Pepsi and Coke had declining sales for a year or two. And that was driven primarily because of uh, changes in the economy. This was during the um, housing bubble burst 2008, 2009. So customers had fewer dollars to spend on luxuries. Plus there was also kind of a, um, a health kick where people didn't want to drink pop so much. And so they started drinking more water and more um, healthy kind of drinks. Um, one approach that both Pepsi and Coke took towards this is to start competing in those areas more. One thing that we'll do as we forecast is calculate the additional funds needed. And I'm going to work through an example of this using the, an Excel spreadsheet um, as I go through this part. Um, in a steady state situation, no excess capacity exists. So let's stop there. What's excess capacity? Excess capacity usually occurs with fixed assets. So think of a classroom. Um, our classroom seats about 40 students. If we have 30 students in the room, we have excess capacity of 10 students. In other words, we could grow the size of the class by 25% without running out of capacity, without needing additional desk or additional space. So when we forecast a financial statement, we have to keep in mind that there may be excess capacity with our fixed assets, so we may not need to grow them with sales. Um, in a steady state situation, there is no excess capacity. In other words, our classroom with 40 seats has 40 students. So in order to grow the size of the class or grow the sales of the class, we'd have to actually increase the size of the room and increase the number of desks available. So in a steady state situation, no excess capacity exists. And so the firm needs to increase net fixed assets and usually net operating working capital to achieve sales growth. So net operating working capital is accounts receivable and inventories. And typically, we'll also include cash in that uh, that are necessary for the day-to-day -day operations of the firm. So in order to increase sales, we have to increase our inventories. And if we're selling on credit, our accounts receivable will increase. And we'll need additional cash to make those utility payments and to pay employees um, and just our day-to-day -day needs for cash. So how do we fund the additional needs, uh, resource needs, to allow us to grow the firm? Well, we fund those using spontaneous liabilities. Oh, sorry. Uh, spontaneous liabilities include accounts payable and accrued expenses. And accrued expenses would be things like accrued wages. So when you go to work, you work for a week or two weeks. During that time, you're creating your, your work hours or creating a li liability for the company that they'll have to go back and repay. But as long as they're not pay, they, they haven't paid you for those two weeks' time, that's actually a source of cash for them. It, it's a liability out there. Um, 
where they're not they haven't paid you yet so that's uh, gives them some cash to work with um, accounts payable same thing probably a little more easy to understand I buy something on credit there's an accounts payable on the books I don't have to come up with the cash for 30 days so that gives me a little more time and a little more liquidity to use for other to pay for other assets additional addition to retained earnings is also a source of funds that that's internally generated that can pay for our additional resources that we need and then after those two are exhausted we usually look at external financing sources um, external financing sources would include uh, raising additional interest-bearing debt and selling additional stock uh, in the company. The equation we use for additional funds needed looks like this, where we have additional funds needed are equal to the operating assets, A with an asterisk, um, at time zero, so for the previous year, divided by sales, the amount of sales for the last year, multiplied by the change in sales. So that delta means change in sales. The way we calculate change in sales is we take the sales growth rate and multiply it by last year's sales. Okay. So the change in sales is the sales growth rate multiplied by the previous year's sales. So those are the additional funds we'll need, or excuse me, the additional assets we'll need to have available to support the growth in sales. The next two arguments are how we actually pay for that those increases in resources or increases in assets. One, the first one is the increase in the spontaneously generated liabilities. So that's the operating liabilities for the previous year divided by the sales for the previous year or the non-forecasted year multiplied again by the change in sales. So that's the additional spontaneous liabilities we expect to be generated from an increase in sales minus sales for time one the way we would calculate this is sales for the last year SO multiplied by one plus the sales growth rate and that we multiplied by the net profit margin net income divided by sales um, and then we multiply that by one minus the payout ratio. This is also referred to as the retention rate. So this is the percent of net income that's retained into the company. So what this gives us is the dollar amount of sales um, that are profits. So in other words, it's what's left over after we paid all of our expenses. And then we subtract out what we pay in dividends to say these are the dollars that are actually retained into the company and used for financing the company. Whatever's left over our AFN is what we need to seek additional outside financing for. So I'd like to show you an example of this. Um, I'll put this spreadsheet out online and we'll s start off by saying our operating assets, so these are the assets necessary for the, the operations of the firm, are $20,000. <coughs> and I'll explain this self-supporting uh, growth rate in a minute. Um, our sales for the year we expect to be $15,000 our operating liabilities are $6,500. Our net income margin is 10%. Our sales growth rate is 9%. And our payout ratio is 60%. Okay. So what that tells us is if we grow our sales by 9% and we pay out 60% of our um, 60% uh, percent of our um, earnings as dividends, at the end of the year we'll need $561 to, or excuse me, not the end of the year, we'll need $561 going into the year um, of additional outside financing to fund the growth of the company. Uh, so we need to take out debt or plan to take out debt during the year to fund our additional resources. You can play with this and put in other numbers to see how they affect things. So let's say our uh, net income grow, uh, falls, our net profit margin falls to 5%. Well, then our additional funds needed increases So because we don't have as many dollars staying in the company. Let's say our operating assets uh, fall to, let's say, 10000 What this actually results in is a, a financing surplus. So we're generating more money. Um, because we don't have as many assets to support, 
So we're generating additional funds that we'd have to actually get rid of either through paying more dividends, repurchasing stock, or just retaining it as a marketable security or short-term investment. All right, so I'm going to uh, turn it back to this. I'm going to explain the self-supporting growth rate, and we'll come back to this spreadsheet. So, oops. So how do we balance the balance sheet? Um, there are three different plug choices. So these would be the additional funds needed, or if there's excess funds, um, how we would take care of those. So in the first case, we have short-term investments in marketable securities. Not really an external fund, but it is something that we can increase or decrease that isn't part of the operations of the firm. So short-term investments or marketable securities are considered to be excess liquidity. In other words, we don't need these funds for day-to-day -day operations. I showed you Apple in class. They have a ton of marketable securities or short-term investments um, where they're just putting excess cash that they generated and they're not really willing to pay out as dividends yet or repurchase stock with. So. Um, we can increase or decrease this amount. So let's say we, we have an, uh, a need for additional funds. We could actually take funds out of our marketable securities or short-term investments and use those to fund the, uh, the, the resource need. Um, there's a feedback. So for each form of balancing or, or method of balancing or what I call the plug, um, there's usually a feedback. So if I put cash into marketable securities, that's going to increase my interest income, and the result of that will be increased retained earnings and less of a financing need. We could also use uh, short-term or long-term debt as a, an additional funding source, or if we have excess cash or excess funds generated, we can actually pay down our debt. The feedback to this is interest expense. If we take out more debt, our interest expense is going to increase. That's going to decrease retained earnings because we'll have a lower profit. Um, and then we'll need additional funds. And you, you end up having what's called an iterative process in order to determine what the, how much debt to use. Finally, we can issue or repurchase equity. If we need additional funds, we could issue uh, more common stock. If we have additional funds that or excess funds that we've generated, we can actually repurchase stock. And we've seen a lot of that in the last few years, and we'll talk about that later on in the course. Um, there's a possible effect on dividends paid here. So um, if the company repurchases stock, they could actually maintain their dividend total amount of dividends paid by increasing the dividend per share. And so that wouldn't have any feedback effect on the company. However, if they're just maintaining the dividend per share, and they repurchase shares, that's actually going to decrease the dollar amount of dividends paid. If they issue additional shares, they may need to increase their dividend payments. So that's something we want to keep in mind as we balance the balance sheet and make our determination of how to get the balance sheet to balance. The self-supporting growth rate, which I mentioned earlier, is the maximum growth rate the firm could achieve if it had no access to external capital. We, this has actually been something of a concern in the past few years, not so much today as it was two or three years ago. Um, we had a kind of a liquidity crisis in America where banks were not in a position to really lend money anymore. So a lot of, especially small businesses, didn't have access to funds, even though they were well operated and they would have been able to repay the debt. Banks just weren't able because of their capital ratios. Um, they, they're required to keep so many deposits on hand for every dollar of, of debt, and if they have risky debts on their books, they have to reserve more against those. So they were in a position where they really didn't have excess funds to lend out. Um, so as a result, a, a lot of firms simply couldn't grow or didn't have the ability to access ex external funds to let them grow. So this is something that you have to look at. So the idea behind the self-supporting growth rate is that this is the rate that, that companies can grow just using their own internal uh, sources of capital. The way that we calculate it is here. Um, it's equal to the net profit margin multiplied by 1 minus the payout ratio or the retention rate multiplied by the previous years or the existing year's sales. And we take that and we divide it by the assets, operating assets minus the operating liabilities. So these are the net operating working capital minus the amount we would be able to retain um, from the profits of the company to fund internal growth.
So in order to calculate this, I put that formula into Excel. And again, I'll put this out online for you. Uh, what we can see here is that the self-supporting gross rate in this example is 4.6512%. If, so we see here there's additional funds needed if they grow at 9%. If I switch this to the self-supporting growth rate, however, there's no additional funds needed. So this is the rate that they can grow without having to seek external or additional funding. The next step after we balance our balance sheet, determine what our uh, sales growth should be, and we kind of have a finalized version of our financial plan, is to look at compensation and, uh, uh, excuse me, compensation plans for executives to get them to meet the targets that they need to meet. Uh, forecasting models can be used to set targets for compensation plans. The key is to reward employees for creating shareholder intrinsic that's a mistake. For creating intrinsic shareholder value, ignore that first shareholder. And the emphasis should be on long run rather than short run performance. So what we're looking at here is key variables um, in the financial forecast. We look at profitability, but again, we want to make sure we're not totally focused on short term profitability. I, I talked a little bit about Kmart in class and how they're not reinvesting funds into their assets. And that can actually be a boost for companies in the short run because they don't need those additional funds needed because they're not um, investing in the fixed assets of the company. And they can have higher profitability and higher cash flows in the short run. But in the long run, that's going to actually hurt the company because their stores aren't going to be maintained. They're going to be ugly. Uh, people won't want to shop in them. And so they're just going to move on to something else. And um, it's going to hurt their company in the long run. So we'd, we'd look for long run performance measures rather than short run performance measures. And that's the end of this lecture. Um, let me know if you have any questions about it. The next lecture I'll put out here is on um, an actual example of forecasting a financial statement. I'll put out a spreadsheet online of a forecast or a non-forecasted financial statement so that you can work through the example with me.